Coming up on Chopper's Politics. Was it the only time you ever looked at pornography in your life? I have looked at it before. You know, I mean, what I will say to you, a lot of people that have been sort of throwing stones at me, I suggest probably have too. It's just that they didn't choose the House of Commons to look at it. Hello and welcome to the Red Lion Pub in Westminster. I'm Christopher Hope, chopper to my pals, the associate editor for politics at the Daily Telegraph. And this is Chopper's Politics. And as I recorded this episode, the news broke that the Met Police had issued a hundred fines in the Partygate saga. It's the culmination of, well, let's say a tricky few weeks for a government dealing with difficult local election results and a series of questionable scandals around the culture in Westminster. One of those was former Tory MP Neil Parrish, who resigned after two of his colleagues said they'd seen him watching porn in the House of Commons. And Neil will be joining us on this podcast for his exit interview as an MP. But first, the person who has been at the heart of these issues for the past two years has been Mark Spencer, first as Government Chief Whip and more recently as the leader of the House of Commons. So I invited Mark Spencer downstairs to my usual stool in the Red Lion pub for a chat. Mark Spencer, welcome to Chopper's Politics. How have you found the transition from being Chief Whip to Leader of the House? Uh, I mean, it's definitely different, isn't it? But uh, obviously the Chief Whip role, you do work quite closely with the Leader of the House. So uh, obviously my relationship with Jacob Rees-Mogg, my predecessor, was uh, a very positive one. We worked together really closely. So it's actually been... I think a relatively smooth transition. Are you, you cajoling? Know? Are you persuading now more than just telling them what to do when you're the um, whip? So I think I'm facilitating. Actually, oh, you know, right. the, the leader of the house's job is to sort of help colleagues across the house, cross mm. politics. So not necessarily just government colleagues, but you know, across the house to try and a get the most out of their political opportunities to improve the lives of their constituents but also to make sure that they conduct themselves in the right way and that we deal with the Palace of Westminster and restoration and renewal. It's it's a big job. Bits fell off the house yesterday, by the way, Uh, just just by the the entrance to uh, Westminster Hall. The house is crumbling. Well, uh, to be fair, that's been the case for a very long time. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. I mean, if you just look look out there at the Mm. scaffold that's everywhere, the house authorities are actually doing a pretty good job at getting up there, up the scaffold, and making sure that we're safe. Mm. Um, but I think what we do need to do is to make sure that everything we do do is towards the final aim of improving mm. the palace long term. So Where are you on the decant versus so, so carrying I, on working in offices? I think, decant I think it's might a red, mean leaving altogether for yeah, 10 years. And I think it's a red herring, to be honest. I mean, I compare it to a, a young married couple buying a house that's old and tired and needs renovation. What you actually do is you move in, don't you? And you go, right, what we've got to fix first? Kitchen first. That's right. Oh, well, number one, are the electrics going to burn the house down? So let's sort that out. Then let's sort the kitchen out. You know, then we can do a bedroom or or a bathroom. And you sort of work your way through it. But you set out the long-term vision. Where do I want to get to? So maybe one day I'll be able to afford a conservatory. You may as well put the doors in while you're doing the... But does that young couple move out for six months and rent? Or do they stay in the house? so, so... I mean, I, I personally would never move out into the caravan and let the builders loose because moving back in, the timescales can change. But I think there is an argument that if we get the plan right and we all know the vision we're trying to achieve, you know, I could see a circumstance where the house authorities or the, or the people in charge of that project say to us, look, we've got to deal with the IT infrastructure or the foul waste infrastructure. What about rising two weeks early in July? not coming back in September and maybe sitting somewhere else in October, then actually you buy yourself a big chunk of time to get some big stuff done. Maybe York. You've got the site in York, haven't you? Well, I mean, there are a number of options, aren't there? But I think we're a long way away from that. Members have got to, A, have confidence that the vision is right, and B, have confidence that those delivering it will deliver to budget and to the timescales that they say they will. And I think there's been a bit of a loss of confidence in the system, which is why Mr Speaker and the the House of Commons and Lords Commissions have said, let's just stop for a second, pause, reflect where we're at, and together work out 
a new uh, mm. aim, a final I mean, destination. The scaffolding's off Big Ben, literally about 100 yards from where we're sitting now in the Red Lion pub. Yeah. But um, I've been up to the top. It's beautiful. They've literally gold-plated it. And the problem with the Palace of Westminster, it's a royal palace, the temptation to gold-plate and go the extra yard that may delay going back in or may delay works is always but, there. But let's recognise it, it is an historic palace that is the property of the UK taxpayer. It, it belongs to the nation. I mean, it, it's you can go anywhere in the world and show a photograph of the House of Commons and people instantly Iconic. know where it, you know, it is. It's like the Taj Mahal. Everybody knows what it is and where it is. And I think we have a duty as the current tenants, if you like, to make sure it's there in 200 years' time for, for the next generation. You're a farmer. Hmm. You've got a farm shop. Mm. You're tipped by many as a DEFRA secretary. It hasn't happened yet. If MPs were animals, what would they be? <laughs> That's a good question. There are lots of options out there to, to that. I mean, it's, it's only you and me talking it's, in the pub now. No is, that, is that right? You know, it's, it's, I'd say a, a cheap whip, they're like cats, so trying to herd them <laughs> is pretty difficult. They're quite independent of mind. Yes. Uh, they tend not to flock together when you really want them to. Yes. They can be pretty difficult to train yeah but i think that's healthy for our democracy isn't it? i've always found you very straightforward whenever i've dealt with you and we have talked a bit even though you yeah. know not formally over the past time when you were chief whip did you enjoy being chief whip yeah i did i did i hope i hope people will reflect that i did a reasonably good job mm. I, I think it's important to treat people fairly so you know c- clearly on occasions when you're chief whip you do have disagreements with people but i think they need to be able to express their view. You need to be able to express your view. And if if you disagree and, you know, to the point where you feel that they require some sort of chastisement, there needs to be a mm. feeling of fairness about that. Yes. So, so you know, I think you need. I need to be able to sit down with people as Chief Whip and say, look, I need your support on this. If you do that, then there mm. will be consequences. Mm. If you do this, there'll be these consequences. Don't don't say that I didn't warn you, but at the same time, open up opportunities for dialogue. So, very rarely do you get to that stage, as, no. or I didn't get to that stage as, as chief whip. What regrets do you have? I mean, the Owen Passon affair was a, a blot on your. Well, not really. Do, do, do you think you were trying to make the system fairer, weren't you, for MPs? But maybe it was the wrong case to get that, behind. That's right. And I think, ironically, we've ended up now in a place where there is an appeal process coming forward. And I think that's it's a fundamental point of you know, UK justice, frankly, that you feel you've got access to, to fair justice. So that involves, number one, anybody who feels they're a victim, giving them the confidence to come forward and the confidence that that allegation will be taken seriously. If you are the individual which the allegation is made about, you need to feel as though you have the opportunity to defend yourself. And if you don't feel like you had a fair hearing, a chance for somebody else independently to look at that and and make an assessment. And I didn't feel as though that system existed. I mean, it it, it may well have been, you know, with with Owen, once we got to the end of an appeal process, the result was the same. Mm. But I didn't feel as though he'd had a chance for an appeal and there were a number of other cases. Do you feel sorry for him? But... Um, it's quite brutal for him. I mean, I, I think you know his personal circumstances were clearly very tragic, weren't they? Of course, he lost um, his uh, wife to suicide. But uh, a few years ago. Uh, and, and you know, on a human level, you can't help but be. But the way he ended, his, his career ended so quickly, I mean, I mean, well, you know, I think I think the investigation was thorough. You know, the results of the investigation are a matter of of public record. So uh, yes, that is it is what it is. But you know, on a human level, yes, of course, I'm. Uh, Sorry, sorry. What's happened to your little black book, the one you kept uh, detailing all the... Oh, I don't, I don't, did you, I don't know. Did it where... even exist? I should remind listeners, uh, famously, Chief Whips have a little black book in which they write down all the peccadilloes and issues of MPs and on the Tory side to use against them to get them to do what they want to do. But the, I mean, Does it even exist? Come on. So, so there is a, a clearly an historic knowledge within the Whips office. So yes. you should never no new Prime Minister, unless, of course, there's a change of government, will wholesalely change the the whips office so you do have that sort of institutional knowledge of colleagues their challenges what and, they care about all yeah that's right stuff. and i think that's really important from uh, you know the, the whips office doesn't really get the credit for the hr stuff that it does you know there's a there's a whole side to the whips office that people don't see that sort of caring supportive you know mps are human beings so they, they suffer with with grief, with family loss, with illness, with all those challenges that affect human beings. And the Whips Office is very effective at supporting 
MPs through that. You know, as a, as a young dad, when I first got elected, my kids were 10 and, and 13. I don't think I ever missed a parents' evening. The whip's office always slipped me to go home for parents' evenings. Mm. You don't hear about that side of, of support that there is there for, uh, for families and for MPs. You only hear about the, you know, the, the unpleasant stuff. And the way it's structured, you have one whip that looks after a flock of a dozen or so MPs. Yeah, and, the, and, and, they're, they're, and they're, they can be very close relationships, you know, that, so you really do get to know your colleagues and, and mm. understand quite enjoyed that side of it to be honest I, I think I got to a stage where the people I was working with as a as a more junior whip I knew what made them tick I knew the stuff that would excite them I knew the stuff that would offend them and so when legislation was coming forward I could quite but is easily, there a little black book containing all the all the things there's an institutional knowledge of, of the, but nothing of, written down no I, I think you know <laughs> it, it's it, whipping is about love not not uh, not punishment and uh, that's often misunderstood. are you surprised how impotent the government has appeared to some people with its big majority it's quite hard to get things through well, I, I, don't, I think that's, Do you think that's wrong and fair what, what does it fail to get through well, I would say that it, the other day there was that there was that um, motion on the prime minister's character. The actual the government folded and accepted the, the, the Labour motion, which actually said he probably no, misled no, no, the no, house. No. That was they, a... they, so we could quite easily have won that motion. Quite well, easily. Why, why, why didn't because because you... the prime minister is yeah. confidence in the knowledge that he has nothing to hide. That it doesn't really matter if the privileged committee want to look at uh, what happened. He has nothing to hide, and you know what? In the end, he just said, "Well, it, it isn't worth having a row over this." Let him have a look at it. But the Labour motion, which the House approved, was that he probably misled the House, or, or was so that the, the Labour motion said that we should be investigated, and, and, and we're we're absolutely confident, as is the Prime Minister, when it's investigated, actually the truth will out. Yeah. And that's been the most frustrating thing about this whole thing. Party gate, yes. Yeah, you know, in, in that everybody else has shouted the rooftops allegations, uh, and uh, we're in this place where we have to wait for the investigations to conclude. Mm. Uh, and the truth is, when all those investigations conclude. Uh, you know, I think I think there'll be a lot of noise, as there has been. But uh, the truth is, the have great you read news... the Sugay report? No, I've not seen. I've not seen the Sugay report. So I, how I do you know, know he's done nothing wrong? Uh, well, number one, I was there. Uh, with all uh, the parties? No, <laughs> hang on. I, I, was in, I was. Uh, I was there. You know, during that period of time, I saw how the prime minister operated. And number two, I think when you actually look at the words he's used and the way in which he's conduct himself well he's used words like I'm, i was told it and did nothing wrong and then i did nothing wrong he's moved around a bit hasn't he i mean that's what no, people i think up. i think when you analyze actually exactly what he said he hasn't misled anybody he's been absolutely his biggest crime he's very open and transparent you know he's very upfront uh, and that is that is his great character and that's what makes him a great and you were none of the parties were you just to be clear for our listeners you uh, sadly i was sadly, not you're popular, too busy not popular enough to be invited to <laughs> oh, any uh, any oh, gathering not fair at all do you why your government's run out of ideas? No. no. What? 33, 30, don't, 33, 38 bills, bills on the I know. Speech. How can that be a lack oh, of ideas? God. You know. It's a lot of ideas, but there's no real central... I mean, you have them grouped on the cost of living, I saw that. But the, the, it is everything, isn't it? Everything, I mean... The, no, 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 no. Why let's aren't you be, doing more now for the cost of living crisis? Why no. not cut taxes? Uh, let's be You're a Tory government, clear. Mark. Yeah. So, so the number one priority for this government is this levelling up agenda to make sure talent is universal across this country. So wherever you're born, you may well be born with talent, but opportunity is not, and that is a tragedy. And this Prime Minister understands that, and he wants to make sure every kid born in this country gets a chance to have a great education. And once they've had a great education, a, a chance for a great career and job in their own community. So they don't have to get on a train and come to London. They can, they can build economic success in their own communities. Can I say that is the clearest definition I've ever heard on levelling up from anyone in government. But that is a, that's a great long-term aspiration. But what about the here and now? What yeah. about the cost of investment so now? Do, that's so, a so, great goal to aim for, but what about yeah, now? But they all link, so they all link together. So, so number one, that's a, it is a long-term aspiration, but you can do stuff today. So you can improve your schools today. You can build infrastructure. Why not cut taxes today? today? Well, and and you know, let's let's be clear. We are cutting taxes. Actually, we're reducing uh, national insurance contributions to seventy percent of those people yes. that pay it. Now that while increasing it for everybody that, at the same well, time. Well, wait a minute. So the thirty percent that can carry that burden, 
oh. are carrying that burden. And I think that's a very good conservative Because you've lifted the policy. threshold, it's paid out so much. It's also supporting our great NHS to deal with the COVID backlog. But I recognise there are huge challenges for people. You know, that the, the prices of food and energy going up is a very big challenge. It's a global challenge. £22 billion worth of support already put in place by the Chancellor of the Exchequer. But number one... We must make sure we do not drive inflation. So it's very easy. If you listen to Labour, they'll drive fiscal easing, they'll pump money into the economy, they would drive inflation, and that would damage the very people that they're screaming to protect. So that's, that's your fear, inflation. Yeah, absolutely, because you, you, you destroy pensioners and pensions, yep. you destroy the low-paid ability to get, um, you know, they, they would be, basically, they would be out-inflated. And it, it's fundamental to have that fiscal responsibility from a Conservative government and not allow us to go back to 70s Labour. Because the easy answer policy. is stepping in. The easy uh, answer absolutely. is... Absolutely. And pumping money into the economy. And actually, you destroy and affect negatively the people you're, you're trying One to protect. One area surely uh, liable to tax is oil and gas companies. This windfall tax idea, which but that, has been but looked it's, at. It, it's a, What's the truth of it? Is the Treasury looking so, at so it? So the, the, here's the absolute truth. When you look at what Labour would propose and the amount they're talking about, you divide that by the number of households, it equates to 42 quid a year. Well, 42 quid a year, well, that makes no difference at all. What the Chancellor's done already, £22 billion pounds worth of support, is huge. But they're looking at the Treasury, aren't they? So, I, I mean, it, the Treasury will look at all options. But actually, again, for medium, long-term and short-term energy prices, we need an energy sector that is investing, not only in oil and gas in the North Sea, to wean ourselves off Putin's oil and gas, but also uh, wind power, solar. There's lots of opportunities for us. On the culture in the House of Commons, why do women feel unsafe? We had Caroline Noakes on this podcast sitting here just two weeks ago and she was talking about how it's like a prep school where none of the inmates are old, older than 13. Do you worry or do you, do you accept this idea that it's, it's a bit schoolboyish and therefore some of the banter, to use that appalling term, is, is unacceptable? So, uh, I mean, clearly there are some... There, there are some people whose behaviour has fallen well below the threshold, which is acceptable. And uh, we need to either mm. re-educate those people very rapidly. And can you believe you, 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 I'm a year younger than you, I think, and can you believe you had to sit down with other, other grown-ups and explain to them that they shouldn't be watching pornography on, on their work phones or, so, or their so, phones at work? So, honestly, it never entered my head to send a memo out to the parliamentary party to say, uh, by the way, don't watch pornography in the chamber. That, that never entered my head to have to send that, that memo. Now, I, I think if we're at that level, mm. then we are in a dark place. But that's, you know, that's one, a- MP. one event. You, you have to recognise... Is that only one MP? Uh, no others have done it as far as you know? I'm, I'm not aware of any other allegations of that nature. So, so I make no moral judgment about pornography. If you want mm. to watch pornography, that's entirely uh, uh, your business. But do that in the privacy of your own home. Mm. Don't do it in the House of Commons chamber when you're meant to be... And in fact, Neil Parrish really can set that. We've had Neil Parrish on this same podcast. Neil Parrish gave us his exit interview as an yeah. MP on Monday and he said as much and he just obviously is apologetic about it yeah. and wish it hadn't happened. He says uh, that um, that the system is is geared up to MPs who want to fight and to wriggle off the hook. He would say there's not enough credit for saying he did wrong. Well, I, I think people would judge, you know, how he presented himself. I, I, I think my wife watching some of those interviews was actually quite sympathetic towards, mm. towards Neil. He clearly has made a huge misjudgment uh, and he's paid a very big price uh, for that. But I think what is absolutely vital is that those people who feel mistreated, victims of misogyny, have the confidence to come forward. Now, we've seen some pretty big cases, not least of all former Speaker, where allegations have been made, they've been taken seriously, they've been investigated, and their sanctions have been have been issued. Now, that, that says to me... This is a system that It works. takes time there. Those, those Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but justice uh, justice has to take yes. time. It's very easy to get quick justice, but is that fair and right? Mm. So what matters is victims are taken seriously. You know, allegations are put and you get a chance to defend yourself. And those people who feel they're victims get a chance to raise their concerns. And, and one thing we've done very recently is introduce this concept of cluster reporting. So if you don't feel you've got the confidence to make a formal complaint you can still log that concern. And and so if someone were to log concerns about MPA and then four or five other people come along and, and log the same concerns or similar concerns, then there's a system whereby the authorities can go back to all of those individuals and say, 
Mm. You understand you're not on your own here. There are a number of people now that have come forward and made similar allegations. You might want to reconsider whether you do want to make a formal complaint. And so you weed out patterns of behaviour. Now, I think that's going to be that a, really, very sensible. a really powerful tool. But important to emphasise, we're talking about a very small minority of, of people here. And, you know, Do you think that place reflects society? Or does it attract a, a, a kind of person who might uh, be prone to this behaviour? No, I, I, I think... I mean, I, so here's, here's how I honestly mm. feel. We're, we're in danger of diminishing the, the status of MPs and the amount in which they're paid. So it's very difficult for me to stand on my doorsteps of my constituency and say the £80,000 a year salary is not enough to attract the right people into politics because £80,000 a year to my constituency is a huge salary, a huge salary. But if we don't pay MPs uh, what is a huge salary, then we'll end up in a situation where only those people who are either independently wealthy can come forward, or those people who've got sort of union support, union backing. So they're not paid enough? Well, as I say, it's very difficult to make that argument, I, I, isn't it? Of course, because but you need... To but, my constituents, it's a very, very But who is the comparable figure? Is a, is a head of a local authority, a head teacher? That's the kind of... Or is it more than that, you know? Yeah. Uh, and maybe, oh, that's what, maybe that's what Ipsa should have done, which is why, of course, we pass this stuff mm. to Ipsa. So are you saying that by paying them 80000 a year, we're getting a less of a good calibre of person? No, over there? no, no. no. What, I'm, what I'm saying is that we need to keep... Ipsa need to monitor that and make sure we're still getting good people coming forward, which I think we are, aren't we? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, I think there's some very good people. Yes, very good. We need to continue the that problem with, with we quick need... elections is, you know, you've got to fill these, all these seats. That's right. You're not scrutinising right. properly, maybe. So, so I think clearly more women would be, I think, a benefit, more diverse backgrounds. I think All women different. shortlist, yes or no? Um, no I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I think, I, I think we've got some brilliant women in the Conservative Party. You know, Foreign Secretary, Home Secretary, they're there not because they're women, because they're brilliant people. And we should celebrate that. You know, we had two female prime ministers. We've got a great track record of, of encouraging women forward. We can do more. We can do better. Um, and that's what we'll do. So, some quick ones. Lee Anderson's in trouble for talking about teaching people to cook on a budget. Is that unfair? I mean, do you think the, he's being singled out because he's a Tory? I mean, if someone from the Labour side said that, they might go, thank you for the advice. I mean, I think it's a great skill to be able to cook your own food. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has that skill set i mean i did home economics when i was at school you know I, I, I was hopeless i tried to boil tomatoes when i first got to university yeah well i, I was know, mocked so by I my think, housemates I, I think lee's trying to support his constituents isn't he he's trying to improve their lives and he's a great advocate for his own constituents what i'm saying is it did tories get a harder time than than labor MPs? Oh, but Maybe, I don't know. Maybe, Cry me a river, you're going to say. Yeah, I, I, Tiny I think violin time. If you, if you join politics uh, and expect you're not going to be criticised, then you're in the wrong game. So, you know, man up, take the criticism and defend what yeah. you believe in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Lee's no shrinking violet. He'll defend what he believes <laughs> he in. He certainly will. And just finally, the next election, October 2023? Uh, I, I, would, I would put my money on May 24, if I'm honest. But, you know, who knows? Oh, that's not my decision, thank goodness. Uh, we've got a lot to deliver, a lot to get right. It's not breath of ideas, got ideas, it's we're, we're the Tories have still got some... Buzzing with ideas, top leadership, literally international leadership through the Prime Minister, great economic steerage from the Chancellor of Exchequer. I, I think the Prime Minister's got a, a, a top team. And are you expecting gonna, a vote no confidence deliver. before July in him? Uh, I, I don't The 54 I don't see letters that. might be breached? I don't, no. I don't see that, to be honest. I, I think... Um, I think the Prime Minister's doing a fantastic job. He's delivering for the country. He's recognised internationally. He's got all the big calls right. He's got a huge agenda to deliver. Uh, I think, you know, Conservative Party and the government need to get behind him and uh, let's deliver for the nation. Well, Mark Spencer, leader of the House of Commons, sometime farmer and cat herder, thank you for joining us today on Chobbles Politics. Great fun to have you on. It's a pleasure. Mark Spencer there. Now do stay with us listeners, coming up next I'll be talking to former Tory MP Neil Parrish about watching pornography in the House of Commons and, whisper it, maybe returning as an independent MP right after this. If you're finding this podcast interesting, you may also like our new daily podcast, Ukraine, the latest. 
Every weekday, The Telegraph's leading journalists bring you the latest news and the most informed analysis of President Putin's invasion of Ukraine. From our newsroom in London and from the ground. The Russian machine has been ground to a halt now for well over a week, and that is just staggering. NATO has to act now. It has to do more than it's currently doing. Otherwise, in this Ukrainian MP's words, you'll have to evacuate the whole continent. One video that we found to be incorrect was bomb squads seen in the Donbass region. The metadata of this clip shows that it was created in 2019, not today. Search Ukraine, the latest, in the same place you're listening to this, and click follow so you don't miss an update. Now, it may feel like we've been talking about it for months, but it was only just two weeks ago that reports emerged of a Tory MP watching pornography on their mobile phone in the House of Commons. And a few days later, the MP in question was named as Neil Parrish, the then MP for Tiverton and Honiton. Unlike other MPs in a similar situation, Neil Parrish put his hands up and resigned swiftly. And on his final day as an MP on Monday this week, he came to talk to me at Chopper's Politics. Neil Parrish, welcome to Chopper's Politics. On what is your last day as an MP? Yes, thank you for inviting me on, Christopher. It's great to be here and just be able to put a few things on the final record. Yes, quite. What happened? Why are, you, why are you quitting as an MP? Because I decided in the end that I had made a terrible mistake um, and it wasn't necessarily illegal, but it was very much immoral and um, should not have been doing it. And so therefore, in the end, I decided, you know, do I go into the, to the system that's designed for lawyers and, you know, and, mm. and, and try and protect yourself and perhaps have to tell lies? Or do you face the truth and be damned. I mean, I've been a, a relatively honest politician all my life. I can't say that I haven't sort of altered a few things and, 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 and adjusted it. I'm not perfect by any means, but I am, you see, I'm a sort of self-made politician, um, brought up as a, a chapel-going boy, quite a bit of a non-conformist. So I really made my own way in politics. And so I made my own way out, uh, albeit a, quite a dramatic way to do it. But you were searching for dominated tractors and then this um, images came up and then you went back and looked again. That was, that was the second time which has caused all the problems. Yes. I mean, I think it was a, a almost a sickness at that stage and um, I think that's what I resigned for. And, um, you know, I shall regret it the rest of my life. I think perhaps the way it was handled and the fact that I wanted to apologise because I never intended any offence, I never intended anybody to see it. I asked the Chief Whip if I could see the two women in, in you know, that had complained. The, the MPs? Yes, but um, that was not possible. Um, he Did referred, they not want to meet you or they? Well, he just referred me to the, to the Standards Board, you see. Yes, it's a kind of legalistic way of approaching. It is. And see, the trouble is when you want to come clean and when you want to try it, do it in a reasonably odd way, albeit, you know, how stupid I was and how, how offensive I was, the system doesn't really work for no. that. It works for somebody who wants to, to, to wriggle and hide. Mm. And if you actually say, right, OK, I've made a mistake, I will own up to it and I'll go. And I talked to my wife about it, you see, and yes. she's been so blooming good. She's been a rock to you. Oh, she's been, she's been wonderful. You understand why people are so offended by what you did. I mean, pornography exists. It's mm. not illegal what you looked at, mm. but it is deeply offensive to a lot of people. I understand that. Um, and, um, you know, I, I just made a big mistake. And, um, you know, if I can, I just want to ask them to forgive what I did. And, um, you know, I've done what I should have done, and that was to go and to go quickly. Um, and it is pretty a pretty painful process, I can assure you, when you do it. But the one thing I have done in life is I've always made a decision. It may not always be the right decision, uh, but I make it, and then I live with it afterwards, and I don't blame anybody else for it. Lots of people blame their fate on everybody else, but I won't do that. You're getting emotional. Do you want to have a pause? No, I'm OK. Keep going. Thank you. Is it, was it the only time you ever looked at pornography in your life, or have you looked at it before? I have looked at it before, so yes. I mean, there's no point in like lots of men have. saying otherwise. And you know, I mean, what I will say to you, uh, Christopher, um, a lot of people that have been sort of throwing stones at me, I suggest probably have two. 
It's just that they didn't choose the House of Commons to look at it. You know, the old adage, you know, those that live in glass houses possibly shouldn't throw stones, is, it naturally comes to me loud and clear. But, but I, that said, you know, I, you know, I've gone. I'm very sad that I went in this way. Uh, and, and, and it's not, you know, I'm not mm. complaining about the system because the system works and you go. I can see tears in your cheeks and you're, you're crying. Can I ask why you're crying? Are you crying for the mistake you made? the impact on your, on your family, the way it's going might overshadow your record in Parliament? I've all three, I suppose, really. First of all, my, my wife and family, my children, and, you know, my greater family. Also, all my friends and colleagues and, and people, and, of course, my constituents who I really enjoyed looking after and, and, and dealing with for 12 years. You know, I, I've let everybody down. And, of course, I've let myself down. But, you know, you hit the bottom, um, and then you have to pick yourself up. And, of course, what you did, if you'd done that in the privacy of your office... None would know. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, it's stupidity and madness, and every now and again, you know, madness does come upon us all. And you see, I think late at night and the late votes and all of those things, I'm not justifying it for a moment, but there is pressure. But like I said, I was very, very wrong. So I'm not, I'm mm. not trying to justify it in any way. And you weren't doing it in a public place to shame women, which is what's been interpreted by some people. I definitely am not, you know, and that I will, you know, go to my deathbed on and that will be my last comment I shall make before I leave this world. So that I can promise. And um, I would be more than happy actually to talk to the two women concerned. to The, assure the two them, witnesses. Yeah, to assure them of that because that was not. I was not proud of what I was doing. In fact, I was trying to conceal it. I had no idea anybody had seen it. Um, so this idea that I was flaunting it, I assure you, is totally wrong. Have you written? to them? I haven't done. But you know uh, who they are. Um, I'm pretty sure I do, um, but I think they like to sort of keep themselves and selves anonymous because that's the trouble. You see, they, they complain anonymously. Uh, you then want to try and rectify the situation privately. Of course, you've got no chance to do that. It was made as a private meeting, wasn't it? With yeah. Theresa May that was there, Chris Eden Harris was there, the chief whip, Oliver Dallin, the, the chairman was there. Were you at the meeting? No. And you first heard the problems emerging, and then this this hunt happened, didn't it? That's right. And of course, once once, re once released to the press, then um, you know naturally the press will yeah. do their job. I mean, I, I have to say that you know not just because I'm talking to you at the Telegraph, the, the Telegraph and the Times journalists um, talking to my wife were pretty kind in the circumstances. Um, and my wife sort of really sort of came up trumps and kept going. And um, by the sort of real drive, she's she's a little lady, but she's got nerves of steel but you know i have to say some of the some of the press outside uh, they will haunt me for the rest of the life my life and i suspect i shall have wake up having nightmares occasionally on that and at the height of the of the, of the search for the for the mp who looked at pornography on their phone you went on gb news yeah, and that what, was, what, that was what, a crazy, that? crazy mistake uh, again. And, and, you know, in all these things sort of caught up with me, basically. Hence, I resigned. And, um, but why, why go on that programme? Yeah, I mean, I went on... To, you know, see, I went, a, Your report was out from, the, yeah, from your... Yeah, exactly. And, and, of course, I, you know, perhaps I ought to not have been quite so naive in uh, having been in politics so long um, that they were sort of land that on me. And so, yes, you know, again, like I said, yet another mistake. And, and you're trying to draw, draw a line below it now. Yes, and, you know, I want to, you know, again, uh, this is a great opportunity to be, me to be able to say to my constituents and all that I've worked with, the councillors, the you know, individuals and, and hundreds and hundreds of people, and I've had lots of messages of support even at this stage. And so I just want to say that, um, you know, we did a lot of good things together and, you know, we will, you know, somehow or other, when this is all over we will try and keep in touch and I just thank them for the privilege of representing them and I, I did represent them well I did do a good job I am a hard worker I mean I was born to work whatever I do if it's physical work political work I work and that's going to be my problem now really is I can get plenty of physical work but it'll be on the, the farm it'll be keeping my brain active my, my father's brain you see went to sleep and um, I, I don't want mine to do the same. Uh, 
Women often talk about how uncomfortable they feel when men watch pornography in public spaces, like on the buses. What message do you think your actions send about that? Yeah, I mean, I understand that, and and that's why I I'm so wrong in what I did. Um, I think we we males sometimes don't realise what we're doing, um, and I think that's where I've been so wrong. And so, this, as you can imagine, has been a real jolt for me. You know, I, I've learned a very, I've learned a lesson and paid a high price, but I have learned that lesson. I promise you. Yes, I bet. Your actions aren't obviously as bad as some sexual harassment issues we've heard in Westminster, but do you think that they, they were indicative of a wider culture of misogyny in Parliament? Or was that unfair? Um, there may or may not be. I mean, the one, one ridiculous point for me to get myself into this situation is if you ask people, you'll find that, that no friendlier and nicer an MP. I never, I never accosted women. I never suggested anything. I might have jokes with them, but, you know, that's all. My office, I can assure you, in 12 years had never been a problem whatsoever. You see, the press tried my office a lot, as you can imagine, over the, over the weekend when it was all going on, and, and there is nothing there. And so, you know, whatever the culture may or may not be, that was not my culture. And I mm. promise you, if you ask lots of people, you'll find that is the case. And that's what I can look you straight in the eye and tell you, because there wasn't a problem with me. And I've blown everything up so successfully yeah. uh, for something that was a complete moment of madness it wasn't and absolutely sent, wrong. It well. wasn't sent you in, in a WhatsApp message, was it? The, no. The, the, some, no. There was some speculation around, no. around the time. Have you been a victim of that culture, do you think? A, a scapegoat, so people ignore more serious offences, by which I mean MPs or others picking on more junior people and... Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, you know, I, again, as I said to you at the beginning of the interview, I, I took a decision to go because that's what, you know, when I talked through it with my wife, that's what we decided to do. And we have done a lot together mm. and, and she has stood by me through thick and thin. So, I mean, I think... As I said to you earlier, I think the system of being referring yourself to the standards board and doing all these things, it's largely down to protect you from, dare I say it, something worse than what I did. Mm. Um, and so I thought, well, I, I, you know, I might have done a, a huge, steady, offensive thing, uh, but did I want to go go with those that had done much worse and, and go in those circumstances? Now, why on earth, you know, the national and international press had to run it for sort of two or three days when people are being murdered in the Ukraine? Uh, we have, you know, cost of living crisis. We have so many problems to deal with. And yet, you know, they, they ran and ran and ran until, dare I say it, I think there wasn't much, you know, much they could flog on the poor old dead horse eventually. A lot of your colleagues, um, female colleagues, said you had to resign. Do you feel, how do you feel about them? Do you understand why they re reacted in that way? Yeah, I do. I understand that. Um, and, um, and I did resign. Uh, um, and you've, so, you've written to Graham Brady, have you? I have, yes. I think what I've written to Graham is that to say, you know, and I say this in all sincerity, is that I finish off by saying we should be nicer to one another within our own party and we are all on the same side. You see, I, I was absolutely wrong in what I did, but it didn't need to be handled in quite this way. I can again promise you that in the, in the 12 years I've been in Parliament and the 10 years I was in the European Parliament, if a colleague was in trouble, I never fanned the flames. And if I'd seen anything like that, I would have immediately referred it to the Chief Whip and said, this guy needs really sorting out mm. big time. And you can imagine if I was really sorted out big time, I would never have done it again. Have you seen other colleagues looking at pornography on phones? I haven't. I in the chamber so, or elsewhere? No. Well, what's next for Neil Parrish? Neil Parrish, um, I think, wants to go home and, 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 and lick his wounds and also, you know, give time to, to let the, the, the shock of what I've done pass. I'll breed some cattle, more cattle, um, probably Herefords or Devons. My wife and I are talking about we're, we're great dog lovers, so we might breed a few puppies. Then, like I said, I, when I'm sort of ready and, and perhaps people are ready for me, I may well offer 
offer my services to charities, animal welfare charities, which I've had a lot to do with. But I think I'm going to take myself a little bit of time just to make sure that that I don't jump into something that that um, then ties me for doing other things. And from first for the ridiculous part of it, I'm almost at the sort of peak of my my political career with yes. the select committee going all guns, you know, pig situation, <laughs> labour situation, get our pigs slaughtered. You know, I'd be working all these things across the board, you know, food, um, uh, plastic re- recycling and, and single-use plastic, you name it, we've been doing it. And then all of a sudden, finito. And so that's going to be difficult. I mean, just looking at your, your majority in Tiverton and Honiton, you've more than doubled it from 9,370 to 24,239. There's a great deal of local support for you, isn't there, within the area? Yes, and I, you know, again, I'm I'm ashamed that I go in the way I do, and again, I apologise. But I think the BBC did say to me that um, what they did find uh, quite interesting is when they went to Tiverton, I think, to find people what they thought of me. Most people had quite a good response to me, albeit they they did not approve of what I did, but they actually approved of me as their member of Parliament, and I've enjoyed yeah. being it. You know, we've been working hard on getting Tiverton High School. We've got the station coming in Columpton and you know community hospitals all of this stuff that I've been working on I think that's the bit that I'm going to find hardest of all well there is there is an option for you isn't there I mean given that there's an option for you that you you use that local support you have amongst uh, farming community and others to stand as an independent in yes, the forthcoming by election. Is that an option for you? It is an option for me and one that I could consider. The only thing that may well stop me is the fact that my you know, local party, uh, my local activists, my local councillors, all which I you know are friends, I don't know that I want to do that to them. Some of the hierarchy of my own party, um, I suppose I wouldn't have the same problem with doing it. But I, at the moment, I'm taking soundings in you this. Raise, raise the money, can you? Oh, I can raise the money. Yeah, yeah. Um, you need a thousand pounds to stand plus I, thirty I ha- votes. I have. Um, I plus have. Nominations. Exactly. Um, I don't think I'd have any problem in doing all that. Uh, I've got some sort of quite powerful backers within the farming community, but but I don't think I'm going there. But uh, like you I might said, do. It's an option for all the horrible situation I got myself into, I tell you what it has done in some strange sort of way, is hugely sort of stimulated my brain and it's going whiz, whiz, whiz all the time. And and of course I like to be, and I am on the whole, a, a very positive person. And of course I've got myself into a hugely negative situation. And so I, I just don't quite know how how to get out of it. But you see, if you ride a horse and you make a huge mistake and you fall off that horse... What do you do? You get back on it again, don't you? Um, And see, there's part of me. And again, like I said, I would love really that, you know, I've always had this sort of slightly wild thoughts, uh, but never, probably never do it. But to stand as a genuine independent. I wouldn't I wouldn't join any other party. I'm not sure at the moment any other party uh, would want me. Um, but, you know, what I could do, you see, 12 years and, and seven years of, of, of chairing a select committee, uh, I, I know how to work cross-party. Uh, and I really would, you know, go, yeah, I would go for food and energy and, 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 and community hospitals and schools and everything, you know, and, I, and don't forget, you know, after 12 years, I know exactly what the constituency wants and what that need and I know they would throw back at me as an independent you'd have no chance and we'd make sure of that but constitutionally you mm. see they can't do that well there's um, quite a history of um, candidates standing at elections to, to save local hospitals yeah Neil Hamilton stood yes. into course against Tories in, in Tatton that's in right 1997 yeah. so you find an issue yeah. if you know it yeah and you see, not not every the one thing I've watched, and you know, I've listened to debates over the years, and I've listened to the opposition, and I think, uh, as my grandfather would say, well, I probably agree with that, but I mustn't say so. And so, you know, that that's where I am really. And so, yes. you see, as a true independent, you could say, well, you know, I I agree with that part of Labour policy. I mean, I I agree with much of Conservative policy. But you wouldn't want to split the vote on the Tory no, side. No, exactly. Let the Lib Dems in. Exactly. That's the and and, bigger and, and issue maybe so, then, therefore, well. you know, that's why one's got to take all this in but but i i'm still going to take i'm still going to take local soundings you just um, decide when neil 
Well, I'll sign. Bef- I'll decide before nominations close. Course, um, yes. And don't forget, I have fought five local elections, two European elections, and and what three or four or five parliamentary elections. Even though it's only twelve years, um, so I know I know how elections work. <laughs> um, and don't forget, I'm a grassroots politician, made my own way through the ranks. Um, so you know, I know how to fight an election if I want to do. But I I think my my office, bless them, are there very good my my thanks to my office and all and well we've always had good offices but we work you know democratically and i run the you know when we've had all the problems with what's been going on in party gate and all the rest mm. of it um i've run it past them as to what we think we statement we should put out i even ran past them the statement they should put out on on me um and so oh, so that's your wife of course too. Yeah, my wife as there's, well there's yeah, four in the team yeah, isn't yeah, exactly, your wife, exactly. Secretary. that's right and sue is uh yeah she's how did you tell her about this at the beginning? I mean, can you? Well, I didn't very much. That was a trouble, and um, so you're so ashamed of yourself. But yes. uh, like I said, she, oh, she, she's been, she's, she's been remarkable. But she knows I'm no great saint, so I'm not coming on here to no. say I am. No. Um, that's not my. Yeah. You know, Do you think that, that there's a pure catanical streak of the way we? That we as a gosh a society pursue our elected officials. Yeah, them. I think we are all human, and we have human frailties. And I don't, you know, I'm not defending what I did at all. But I think we've got to be careful that we don't become a society that that everybody conforms to to what is the sort of the acquired wisdom of the day. And the result could be it puts off more men from entering politics because they feel they can't possibly. Um, sign up to the standards required or women too might feel worried about colleagues looking at pornography it's all has that that could be the legacy of all this yeah I, I hope not because I want people you know I had the opportunity to sort of come from a from a farming background and and sort of fight my way through politics and and and, and acquired you know three O levels left school at 16 to build cows uh, and came through with the Oxford graduates and all the rest so you know I mean I I'm proud of what I achieved and and also Parliament and democracy uh, and the Conservative Party allowed me to do that. And so that's why, you know, I, I'm not going to go independent too quickly. But, you know, I've only got until nomination closed to, to make that decision. We hours, just hours before you give your pass back as an MP. What, what would be your epitaph, Neil Parrish? I think my epitaph will be very much that I fought the calls on agriculture, food and animal welfare and the food for all. And, of course, deforestation, I've also fought that. And, of course, Putin did ban me from Russia. Previously, I was banned by Mugabe from Zimbabwe because I, I, I was an election observer and he didn't like my, my pontifications on his corrupt election. So my epitaph is very much that I did it my way uh, and I fought the corner and I worked very hard. Well, Neil Parrish, soon to be the former MP for Tiverton and Honiton, Thanks for joining us this week on Troubles Politics, and we'll we'll watch what you do next with interest. And Christopher, thank you very much. Um, in some strange sort of way, this has been therapeutic. Thank you. Well, that's all for this week, listeners. I'm dying to know your thoughts about what Neil Parrish had to say. Should he stand as an independent? What about Mark Spencer? Do you think MPs are paid enough? You can get in touch by emailing me chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or we're on Twitter we're at Choppers Podcast and as I always say you get the best of the Telegraph's quality journalism when you're a subscriber so why not sign up now please go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper for your first month's access completely free of charge and for more political gossip do read my Peterborough Diary column out every Friday evening at 7pm on the Telegraph's website and in Saturday's brilliant newspaper. Thank you again to my guests this week, Mark Spencer and Neil Parrish. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wells, Giles Gear, and Theodora Luludis. And as ever, thank you to you for listening. I mean it. And finally, please do buy a copy of the Delhi Telegraph if you can. You won't regret it. Until next time, though, from the Red Lion Pub, cheerio!